Welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Dayton and I am the VP of Advocacy for the Greenwich League. We are delighted for you all to meet our guest speaker, Andrew Garber, who has joined us for our program titled State and Federal Voting Rights, What's Next? He comes to us from the Brennan Center in New York, an independent nonpartisan organization that seeks to identify problems and provide empirical findings on pressing legal and policy issues. Our purpose here in Greenwich is to provide an educational forum on reforms to voting rights in Connecticut and the United States. Before we start, I just want to quickly go over some event logistics. This is a webinar, so you can see us, but we cannot see you. Andrew will speak for about 30 minutes, followed by questions from the league, and then about 15 minutes of questions from the audience. If you have a question for Andrew, please type it into the Q&A. You will notice the chat function is not available. My partner on this program, Nancy Duffy from the League Board, will be moderating the question and answer session. With that, I am pleased to introduce Andrew Garber, a fellow within the Brennan Center's Voting Rights and Elections Program. Prior to joining the Brennan Center, he was a litigation associate at Simpson, Thatcher and Bartlett, where his work focused on commercial litigation, along with a wide range of pro bono matters. Garber is a graduate of Columbia Law School, where he was a Harlan Fisk Stone Scholar and served as an articles editor to the Journal of Law and Social Problems. During law school, he also served as clerk to US Senator Chris Coons on the Senate Judiciary Committee intern to Judge Paul Gardeth in the Southern District of New York, and intern in the bill drafting unit of the New York City Council's Legislative Department. Barbara holds a BA in Political Science from Villanova University. And now over to you, Andrew. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's really great to be here, and it's great to get to speak with the, uh, the League of Women Voters. You guys are an awesome organization. I know the Brennan Center is always really excited to get to partner with you, and I'm happy to be here tonight. So as previewed a little bit, I'm going to talk about some of the voter suppression we've been seeing nationally, some of the specific issues that are going on in states across the country, and some of the ways we can address it, including a little bit about the federal legislation we just saw uh, not quite make it through Congress. Um, and then I'm going to transition in the second half and talk about the state of voting rights in Connecticut and some reforms we've been seeing. There. Starting on a, a bit of a somber note, though, we're seeing a wave of voter suppression across the country. It's something that began before the 2020 election, but has really grown since 2020 exponentially and continued uh, last year and even into this year. In 2021, 19 states passed 34 laws restricting the right to vote. More problematically, 440 bills restricting voting access were introduced across the country. That's more than a third of the total number of such bills that have been introduced since the Brennan Center started keeping track in 2011. Stating a num another way, from 2011 to 2020, the number of restrictive voting bills that were introduced across the country was only twice as many as were introduced last year alone. And the problem didn't end when we turned the calendar this year. At least 13 bills were pre-filed for 2022 legislative sessions. Pre-filed bills are things the legislatures tend to prioritize, so we may see action on many of those. And at least 152 restrictive bills were carried over from legislatures last year into this year. These numbers are particularly concerning because not every legislature meets in 2022. Some state legislatures are very part-time and they only meet every other year. So those numbers would perhaps be higher if all state legislators were meeting. Looking back at the 2020 election though, one thing we should be celebrating is how successful it was. It went off really well. We all recall that it happened during a pandemic and there was a lot of fear and concern. Would people be able to vote? Could they vote safely without risking their health? What was gonna happen? Well, one of the things that happened was state and local election officials did a terrific job generally of finding ways for voters to vote safely and to vote 
secure ballots that were counted appropriately. We saw an election that went off um, pretty much without a hitch. Uh, as a general matter, of course, a lot of things happen in individual precincts around the country. And in fact, the Trump administration's Secretary of Homeland Security called the 2020 election the most secure in American history. But we're not sitting here a little over a year later celebrating the great steps we took in 2020 and how we've moved forward with them. Unfortunately, we're talking about the voter suppression efforts that have amplified since then. Well, what justifies these laws? Supporters of these measures will tell you it's to stop voter fraud. This rationale is both false and convenient. Why is it false? Well, there's no evidence of widespread voter fraud in our country, including in the 2020 election. Research shows that an American is more likely to be struck by lightning than to commit voter fraud. It's extremely rare, something we see almost no evidence of happening and something that's researched a lot. The Trump administration had a whole presidential committee that looked into voter fraud. It was disbanded quietly when it found nothing. The Texas Secretary of State's office dedicated tens of thousands of work hours last year to finding fraud in the 2020 election. They turned up nothing. Why is it a convenient narrative? Well, it's hard to disprove a negative. It's hard to definitively say there are no instances of voter fraud because you can always argue, well, we're just not catching them. They're getting away with it. Um, likewise, we're seeing some politicians who are now arguing it's the threat of voter fraud that justifies these laws. Well, why are constituents concerned about voter fraud? Because those same politicians are yelling that it's a problem. You can see it's a vicious cycle, yell that there's a problem, scare people, say the fear is the reason we need to enact these suppressive laws. The real reason, on the other hand, seems to be that there's segments of power in this country that don't like the way the country is changing. And as it gets more diverse, they think they are better off holding on to power by suppressing the vote rather than growing with the changes in our country. And the evidence we have on voting and voting laws tends to bear this out. What they call election integrity bills consistently target methods of voting used successfully by minorities. And there's often a pretty quick line between minority turnout increasing and suppressive measures coming in. You'll hear some people argue this is nothing like Jim Crow. And of course, others will argue this is just the new Jim Crow. Well, it's true that these measures aren't things like poll taxes or literacy tests or going back a little further, all white primaries. But what's also true is that people looking to suppress the vote are getting more crafty and they're getting more targeted and nuanced in how they do it. So I'd like to walk through a few of the ways in which we're seeing it happen more and more. The first is through restricting access to mail ballots. Mail balloting is essential to people who have trouble getting to the polls on election day. Um, I, I don't know about everyone in the audience. I'm lucky that I have a job where if I need to leave for an hour to go vote or go to the dentist or something, it's generally no problem. I send an email to my team. But that's not the case for a lot of people. They need to be physically there to do what they're doing at all times. They work an hourly job and they don't get paid if they leave or their boss might threaten to fire them if they can't make a shift. Likewise, some people might have tr uh, difficulties with transportation and getting to the polls. They might have to walk a long way to a bus and transfer to another bus. These are serious challenges along with childcare or other family care. You can't always decide when you can get a break from taking care of kids or other family members who need help. Mail balloting helps alleviate those problems. Before 2020, demographically, it didn't look like mail balloting was used much more often by one racial group than another. That changed and it was black voters who became far more likely to vote by mail in 2020. In Georgia, we saw that up to 30% of black voters who voted did so by mail. So there was no fraud in the election in Georgia in 2020. That's something that's got a lot of attention in the news. The Secretary of State in Georgia came out and confirmed that. So we see it's a pretty small step from seeing that black voters are voting by mail to Georgia making it harder to vote by mail. There doesn't seem to be much other explanation for it. In a similar vein, we've seen states eliminate access to drop boxes. That's where if you have a mail ballot, you can go put it in a secure box and the uh, local election officials will collect and count those. During the 2020 election, the state of Texas implemented a rule allowing only one drop box per county. Think about who that affects. Not as much the smaller, more rural counties, 
but the large urban diverse counties. So for example, Harris County where Houston is, is one of the largest in the country. One drop box for that entire county meant millions of people who had access to mail ballots literally had one box to put them in. Purges are another way we're seeing restrictive voting laws come into play. So you, you may also hear these described as voterless maintenance procedures. It's where the state goes through and systematically removes the names of people they believe are no longer active voters from the voting rolls. Now, keeping up to date with the voting rolls is good. Um, that, that's not something that we advocate against, but the problem is the purges have a long history of being discriminatory. The 2019 Ohio voter, voter roll purge led to depressed minority turnout in the 2020 primary election next year. Similarly, the 2019 purge effort in Texas was blocked by a federal judge for being discriminatory. When these are done under good practices and in a careful and thoughtful way, it's good to keep the voter rolls updated, but far too often they are a pretense for removing minority voters from, from the uh, polling logs. Additionally, we saw states reduce polling place availability, something we saw in 2020, and it's something that we've seen in some of the laws that have passed or bills that have been proposed, and it's often blamed on funding issues or some precincts just not having as many people, but inevitably it falls on the urban diverse areas. So for example, during the 2020 primary election in Wisconsin, the city of Milwaukee, the most diverse portion of the state, had only five polling places open total. That certainly depressed turnout overall, but it was Black voter turnout that was down the most relative to the primary four years earlier. Taken together, these changes all lead to longer lines to vote. And again, we see that this affects minority voters the most. Latino voters wait up to 46% longer than white voters in line, while Black voters wait 45% longer on average. Uh, this one, I think, is pretty straightforward. Longer lines discourage voting. It's great when people are willing to stand out there for an hour, two hours, five hours to cast their ballot, but it's not reasonable to expect everybody to, and it's certainly not the way we want our democracy to function. Voting should be convenient and quick. Some of the bills we're seeing are also going to subject election officials to more voter intimidation. 2020, there were a lot of news stories about efforts to intimidate voters, harass voters, and we're seeing more of it in the law. So for example, Texas last year passed an omnibus restrictive voting bill called SB1. SB1 has this provision where a poll watcher can't, or excuse me, an election official cannot remove a poll watcher from the polling place unless the poll watcher has committed a crime. If the election official is mistaken and the poll watcher has not committed a crime, then that election official can be criminally prosecuted for that mistake by a prosecutor who wasn't there. So turning on to a second but related issue we're seeing is election sabotage. Uh, unlike efforts to repress who can vote, election sabotage are efforts to undermine the legitimate results of an election through techniques such as partisan reviews of the election or just outright giving power to partisan officials to overturn the results. Six different states engaged in partisan reviews in 2021, and in those pre-filed bills I talked about earlier for 2022, five of them would allow such partisan reviews. One, you may remember getting the most headlines, was in Arizona when the state legislature contracted a group that called themselves the Cyber Ninjas for the purpose of finding fraud in the 2020 election because they didn't like the result. Well, even with many, many methodological problems, the Cyber Ninjas didn't find any. On the other hand, when it comes to uh, some other ways that legislatures and partisan actors are looking to affect the outcome, Georgia passed an omnibus voting bill last year as well, and it has this really disturbing provision where authority is transferred away from the Secretary of State into the partisan legislature. It does it in two ways. First is elections are overseen in Georgia by the State Election Board. Previously, the Secretary of State had generally been the one running the board uh, and was the person to whom or it was accountable, well now it's the legislature. The legislature has authority over the actions of the board. Even more concerningly, the legislature now has given itself the power to remove local election officials. Put yourself in the shoes of a local election official. You wanna do right, you want the election to run as smoothly as possible, but if leaders in the legislature are saying they expect certain results, well, your choice is now either do what you think is right and possibly get fired, 
or bow to what the legislature wants, that's really, really concerning. We've also seen several bills that would empower partisan officials to straight up change the election results. Texas's law had a provision, and it's important to note this provision did not pass, it did not make it into the final bill, but it was called overturning elections. And it would have allowed local judges to throw out election results if there were enough supposedly illegal votes, votes to change the outcome without any requirement that the plaintiff in the lawsuit actually prove there were enough illegal votes that it changed the outcome of the election. But uh, I talk a little bit later about important things you can do and advocating loudly and publicly matters. The minority party in the Texas House of Representatives fled the state to deny the majority party a quorum. It caused the bill to be delayed several months before it passed. During that time, there was a lot of backlash against the law. And this was a provision that got a lot of attention. And when the uh, Texas leg legislature was able to reconvene, this was a provision they took out. Um, those efforts obviously couldn't stop a lot of other bad things in that bill from becoming law, but this was one they were able to get rid of. I'm gonna pause there for a moment to say that we're obviously in favor of doing things to make elections safer, smoother, and more secure. And there's some concrete steps we can take to do those things and also to make sure everyone can vote. So what could we actually be doing to make elections more secure? Well, the first thing is we can pass legislation to help protect the election officials I've talked about. A Brennan Center report last year found that one out of every three election officials reported feeling unsafe in their jobs. And one out of every five said their lives or the lives of a family member had been threatened because of their work. Election officials make elections work. It's not just setting up tables. They're the ones counting ballots. They're the ones implementing the laws. If a storm hits, they're the ones figuring out how to make sure people can vote. In spite of these concerns, they need to be protected. We need the best people feeling safe, confident, and happy in doing those jobs. We can update cybersecurity systems. These are run at the state level. They're often out of date. We can expand the use of paper voting records. Those provide an important check if there are technical concerns or if somebody challenges the authenticity of the outcome. We can conduct regular, transparent, risk-limiting audits that are done by nonpartisan actors. Risk-limiting limiting audit is just a term that refers to audits being run in a certain way with certain practices to make sure all votes are counted accurately and the results reflect the will of the voters. Something else we could be doing is implementing online voter registration everywhere. You may have seen some stories for the last couple of weeks down in Texas. They don't have online voter registration. Um, and they're now saying supply chain issues are preventing them from printing enough paper forms for everyone to be able to vote. Um, and I see Jennifer's back on screen, so I will pause there for the moment. Thank you. We need to segue from the national scene to something more close to home. So in contrast to some US states, Connecticut voters actually have the opportunity for expansive voting rights because we are, although the most restrictive state in terms of our constitution, there will be a referendum on the ballot this November and it's very important that all of our voters know about it. So I'd like to segue now to Connecticut. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Um, so on the Connecticut scene, I'm actually going to start talking about Connecticut by framing it in comparison to a few other states. So you might have heard recently with uh, the conversation around the federal bills going on that we shouldn't be focused on some of the states I've talked about tonight, like Georgia and Texas and Arizona. We should be focused on states like Delaware and New York because they're worse than those other states. Uh, they don't, for example, have no excuse mail balloting, or they might have long deadlines for registration before the election. As a voting rights advocate, I'm gonna criticize any state that makes it hard to vote and credit any state that makes it easy to vote. So when Georgia made mail balloting more accessible during the 2020 election, they deserve credit for that. Delaware and New York likewise should be criticized for some of their features. And in fact, in 2018, one of my colleagues wrote an article saying New York had the worst voting system in the country. We will do it when it's warranted. But a really key point here is that some states are improving their voting laws and others are making it worse. I've talked about the states that are making it worse, but Delaware and New York are examples of states that are improving. They're trying to implement things like same day registration, no excuse mail balloting. They're trying to expand early voting and that deserves credit, but it doesn't mean those states are immune from criticism as they get there. Connecticut then is a state I would say similar to those like Delaware and New York. They 
uh, as Denver Preview to have some out of date policy still. They've been hard to change, but the momentum in the state has been to change them and to make the laws more modern and expand voting rights. In 2013, Connecticut enacted Election Day Registration, also known as Same Day Registration, that allows people to register and vote at the same place on Election Day. It's different from a polling place, but uh, voters are able to do that. In 2014, Connecticut launched online voter registration. And in 2016, Connecticut launched electronic voter registration, which is where customers of the DMV are asked if they want to register to vote. If they say yes, they fill out the form there, and it's the DMV that's responsible for transmitting that registration. Connecticut also took positive steps during the pandemic. In 2020, they mailed every voter an absentee ballot application. And in 2021, they continued to make absentee ballot applications available to all voters, although they were no longer affirmatively mailing them out. They also put at least one and often more drop box in every town. That's in stark contrast to Texas, which allowed one in every county. And importantly, Connecticut wants to make those drop boxes permanent moving forward. That's just more ways for people to cast ballots. They're safe, they're secure. Uh, another way people can avoid long lines, avoid health risks, vote when is convenient for them. Connecticut also took a great step forward last year when they reenfranchised formerly incarcerated people. Previously, the law had had this strange nuance where people on probation, but not people on parole, could vote. This was confusing, it impacted communities of color the most, and it deterred people who were otherwise eligible from voting. You don't want to make a mistake. Voting when you're not allowed to in every state is crime, certainly not something you would risk. Additionally, Connecticut was the only state still making this parole probation distinction. And so it took until last year in a special session in June 2021 for the state to pass what's called SB 1202. Uh, the Brennan Center was really excited about this because they played a role along with the coalition of many Connecticut-based groups to secure the bill's passage and to restore the vote to thousands of people who were living and working in Connecticut's communities. That means everyone you, you live and work with alongside you can now vote and participate in the community and in their democracy uh, in all the other ways they've been able to. Connecticut had been the only state in New England that had barred non incarcerated people from voting, and it was the 21st state to allow all citizens living in the community to vote. And I want to take a second to applaud all those achievements. Ten years ago in Connecticut, you couldn't register to vote on election day. You couldn't register to vote online, and if you were on parole, you couldn't vote, but you could if you were on probation. The question then is where else Connecticut can improve, and there are a few areas. The first is in mail ballot. It remains state law in Connecticut that you can only vote absentee for if you're one of five reasons, such as active military, if you know you'll be out of town on election day, if you have an illness that prevents you from appearing, religious beliefs prevent you from appearing, or if you have a physical disability that prevents you from appearing. That's a lot of people who don't have the option of voting by mail. I've talked about the virtues of mail voting already. So I'll mention again, it cuts down lies, lines, and it also allows people time to receive and look at a ballot and research the candidates and issues they're voting on and not be surprised when they show up in person and, and try to parse through. Another step Connecticut could take is allow early voting. 39 states in DC currently allow early voting. And as I've said, it has similar benefits to mail voting, whether it's shortening lines, helping people who can't choose when to take time off work or when to take time off family care. Um, if they need to vote potentially at night or a weekend, those are opportunities for them. And as uh, Jennifer previewed, there's good news on that front because early voting is on the ballot this year in Connecticut. So the Connecticut Constitution currently prohibits early voting, which is why it's going to take a bit of a process to change it. And there's two paths to a constitutional amendment in Connecticut, but both require a public referendum. The legislature, in this case, was able by major simple majority vote to pass uh, this ballot initiative during two consecutive legislative sessions. And the first was in 2019, and then they passed it again in 2021 to send it to the people. Great news was that it got strong bipartisan support in both houses, both times it passed the Connecticut House of Representatives 90 to 35 in 2019, before passing 115 to 26 in 2021. And it passed the Connecticut Senate 23 to 13 in 2019 and 26 to 9 in 2021. So uh, the Brennan Center is a nonprofit. I can't tell you um, how I think you should vote on the initiative other than tell you that 
you should vote on it. And I want to give you some background to help make that decision. The measure would change the Constitution to allow the legislature to enact laws around early voting. That doesn't mean if the initiative passes, there will instantly be early voting. It just removes a barrier that prevents the legislature from doing so. An important point to make here is that ballot initiatives like these are never a given. New York last year, we had on our ballot both no excuse absentee mail voting and shortening registration deadlines. Uh, similarly, the New York Constitution does not allow either of these things. Both those measures failed. So there, there are different reasons that can happen. Um, these questions can be confusing. They talk about amending the Constitution to permit the legislature to shorten deadlines or to allow early voting. It, it can be intimidating, um, particularly when we're talking about amending the Constitution. That can sound scary. Now, I will say that the text of the Connecticut uh, initiative is written pretty cleanly. It says, shall the constitution of the state be amended to permit the General Assembly to provide from early voting? But I would still encourage you not to think that Connecticut is different and unlike New York, it may simply pass or simply not pass. In 2014, Connecticut voters had a functionally identical proposal on the ballot. It had similar strong support from the legislature. And as you know, since it's on the ballot again this year, it failed. It was a close vote, 52 to 48, but it did ultimately fail to succeed. There's also the possibility with ballot initiatives that a minority will really pour resources against the passage of an amendment, while the majority um, fails to dedicate the same resources, and that shouting drowns out those in favor. Another important point here is even if the measure passes, that doesn't mean Connecticut will automatically end up with early voting. The legislature still has to enact it. There could be opposition that shows up for the first time before the legislature or under resources could be poured in then. The legislature might just not make it a priority. It might move slowly in time. Additional time could pass without early voting being enacted in Connecticut. There's also the possibility that the legislature uh, takes advantage but does so very piecemeal. Two days of early voting is nice. It's nowhere near the level of, say, two weeks of early voting. So there's still a lot of uh, things that could stand in the way between now and Kennedy getting to a place where we can say it has robust early voting that we should uh, feel very great about and very strong. So I'm going to close by talking quickly about some of the things you can do to be involved in voting rights. Well, the first is to vote. I know it's obvious, but it's the thing that makes the most difference. Uh, you should vote every time in every race, every ballot initiative. Don't pick elections off. Don't assume things will come out a certain way just because of what you hear in the news. The second is you can advocate for voting rights. You could call elected officials, both in Congress and state legislatures. They listen. They write these things down. Participate in public actions like marches and tweet storms. I talked about with the Texas bill, although the publicity wasn't able to kill it entirely, it got some really bad provisions out of there, like that overturning elections war. You could attend local hearings. Uh, states have been hearings, having hearings this year on redistricting, for example, make your voice heard against gerrymandering. You could serve as a poll worker. I know I've talked about it being a scary time for poll workers, and that's true, but we need dedicated people who will go out, do the job, do it honestly and in a nonpartisan fashion. Even just offering your support to poll workers can make a difference for them. You could work with groups that register voters whether it's people simply in your life, making sure your friends and family are registered and voting or through a community group. If you're an employer, you could offer paid time off to your employees so they can vote or serve as poll workers. You could volunteer with uh, groups like the Nonpartisan Election Protection Hotline. That's 1-800-OUR-VOTE and they just have people in a phone bank When voters call with questions and they answer them, that's it. You could provide physical or language assistance to voters who need it. Uh, those are federally protected rights and rights that are dependent on the help of others. Finally, and I know this is taking it a step further, you could run for office, whether it's something highly local or something more prominent. It makes all the difference. So many office holders talk about uh, when they first thought about doing it, it sounded crazy. They didn't know if they had the support, but once they went and did it, they realized how achievable it was. The last thing I'll leave you with is to believe in and promote the truth. We see so much misinformation these days. It's so damaging. Learn how to identify misinformation. Take the effort to combat it when you see it, when we can believe in truth and everyone can agree on the same set of facts, we can achieve a lot more. There, I will pause. Great.
Andrew, thank you very, very much for informing us about the specific challenges and opportunities in the voting rights debate. We appreciate it so very much. Um, so we are going to transition now to the question and answer part of the event. And um, the league has prepared about nine questions for you. And I want to remind the audience to please put your questions in the, into the Q&A. Okay, um, question number one is, what are your views on barring Congress from overturning a presidential election result um, unless a state sends competing slates of electors to decide the result? Would a revision of the Electoral Count Act be sufficient to safeguard our democracy? And if you could just remind us what the Electoral Count Act of 1887 is all about. Thanks. Sure, happy to. Um, always, always enjoy the getting to talk about the 19th century voting laws as well as the new ones. Um, so there's two parts to that question. The first part about overturning a presidential election um, in Congress is that's something that's a real concern. It's something I think as Americans we can all agree we want to see the will of the voters reflected in the final outcome and not allow some procedural mechanism or just angry partisans to change um, a result. So it's important we take additional steps to prevent that. That turns to the Electoral Count Act, which is a 19th century act that sets out when the states send their electors in the presidential election to Congress, it is Congress who technically counts and approves them. It's generally a ceremonial process. And shortly after the Civil War, there were some issues. Um, but really, for about 150 years, there was no problem until we saw in 2020 there were efforts to use the Electoral Count Act in Congress to overturn the will of the voters in certain states. Now, reforming the Electoral Count Act is really important. We need to change it to say things like the vice president's role is purely ceremonial. You remember, there's pressure on Vice President Pence to use that role to throw out electors. It, it doesn't look like the law currently allows that, but making it very clear would be a great step. However, just changing the Electoral Count Act isn't alone is not enough to safeguard our democracy. The metaphor I like to use is you need to make laws to protect both who's allowed to play the game and who keeps the score of the game. The Electoral Count Act refers um, or relates to who keeps the score. But if you've rigged the rules so you decide who gets to play to begin with, it doesn't matter who's keeping score. The electoral Count Act reform is important, but it is absolutely not a substitute for other important voting reforms. I didn't quite get a chance to talk about them in detail, but we saw the Freedom to Vote Act and John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act almost make it through Congress come up just short against the Senate filibuster. The various provisions in both those laws that will protect people's right to vote and make sure we're uh, securing the rules of who gets to play the game are just as important as any reform to the Electoral Count Act. So, um, you know, when we hear some of the talk of why don't we put the big reforms aside and just do the ECA, it's not enough on its own. And we, we shouldn't give in to that, uh, to that urge, I guess, when there's such important changes that can be made to protect voting rights. Great. Okay. okay. Question two is, must congressional action to protect voting rights be taken only on a bipartisan basis. We know throughout history that has not always happened. Um, if so, what is the best way to bring Republicans and Democrats to a compromise? Sure, thank you. So um, as a starting point here, bipartisanship is of course important generally. We want to agree and we want to pass laws that have the broadest coalition and the widest range of support. That's important. But as you said, Nancy, uh, the reality is in the voting rights sphere that hasn't always been the case. The president of the Brennan Center actually did an op-ed in Politico a couple of weeks ago detailing that history. So for example, the 15th Amendment bars um, states from uh, discriminating against the right to vote on the basis of race, color, or national origin. It's what protected, created, in fact, the right to vote uh, for Black citizens in our country and many other minority citizens in our country passed shortly after the Civil War. It went through Congress without a single Democratic vote. Um, the Republican Party, known as the Radical Republicans at the time, um, had a large enough majority in Congress to just push it through. Looking back at that over 150 years later, I hope we can all agree that even though it didn't have bipartisan support, finally enshrining the right of all citizens to vote, regardless of race, was well worth it. So we need to think about the importance of voting rights when we 
um, and that if both parties can agree, we shouldn't let action be stifled simply uh, because we're shooting after a, 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 oh, excuse me, a bipartisanship that might not come in the moment. The other thing that's really specific to this moment is these voter suppression laws we're seeing in states across the country aren't happening on a bipartisan basis. And it's really concerning, um, and I think a really problematic asymmetry to say, well, voter suppression is happening on a party line basis, but any reform to enhance voting rights, that has to be bipartisan. We want bipartisanship. Uh, we want to see these laws. We want everyone to agree on these, these laws and these common sense reforms, but we can't allow voting rights to be stifled. Okay, great. Question three, is there evidence that laws in other states cause voter suppression that can alter election results? Uh, as a starting point here, I think it's worth mentioning gerrymandering. We don't necessarily think of gerrymandering as a form of voter suppression, but in a lot of ways it is. It's the legislators picking their constituents. It should be the other way around. We should pick politicians. They shouldn't pick us. Um, and when they draw the boundaries to entrench themselves in power and to potentially get some of their political uh, enemies out of power, that is a form of voter suppression. It results in a body of power that doesn't reflect the will of the people. I'll also mention Georgia um, as an example of a time um, or situations where outcomes may have been affected by voter suppression measures. There's, that's something that's really hard to prove methodologically. There's um, obviously, a lot of factors that go into elections, turnouts go up and down, they're about candidates at the end of the day. But in Georgia in 2018, uh, the state purged over 50,000 voters, over 80% of which were voters of color. I'll mention, of course, Georgia's general population and voting age population is nowhere near 80% voter people of color. The governor's race that fall was decided by about 50,000 votes. Obviously, we can't say one directly impacted the number, but when you see the numbers are that close, you realize how close these things can be. And to take a step back uh, and think about Georgia a little more holistically, they also did a voter roll purge in 2017 that removed 560,000 names. They did another one in 2019 that removed another 313,000 names. They then had a presidential election in 2020 that came down to about 11,000 votes. Was the outcome changed? Very, very hard to say for many, many reasons, but we've seen hundreds of thousands of people removed from the rolls in Georgia, disproportionately people of color, and then we see razor tight elections. These things can make differences. Okay, question four. Since the Freedom to Vote Act did not pass, will election races be significantly less competitive? Another good question. A colleague of mine is an expert on redistricting. Michael Lee had an op-ed about this a few weeks ago, and he makes a really great point, which is that with redistricting, especially uh, in the political atmosphere we have today, we really focus on Democrats versus Republicans. Who's winning? Which party is control of more states to get more seats? Um, and that's a real and serious concern, but that does not tell the whole story. Even if in the end, gerrymandering doesn't affect the balance of power, uh, in Congress or in a state legislature, it has serious effects. One of the key uh, strategies we see by politicians is called cracking and packing, where they make some very, very safe districts and they basically say, we, you know, we'll let the minority party have these couple districts, but th they'll win so easily that we'll get more districts by creating ones that are a little closer, but still comfortable for us. What that means is communities of color are often packed into districts where their power could be more evenly dispersed throughout the state and more reflect the ways in which they live. Instead, they're all grouped together. And it also fosters less competitive districts, which goes to the heart of what you were asking. We get more and more officials pushing further to the right or further to the left when they realize that if I win my primary, the general election will be a relative breeze, pushes people to the extremes, it disincentivizes compromises. Uh, it disincentivizes running to the more general population of the state and focusing only on the minor area of the politicians themselves. Okay. okay, question five, and you referenced this a little bit in your talk. Um, under what circumstances should state election officials be required to perform post-election audits? Under all circumstances. Um, risk limiting audits, as I mentioned, are really important to take a look back at the election to make sure it ran the way it's supposed to, that there were no regularities, that the final count was the count uh, that reflects what actually 
is cast by voters. But the really, really important point here is that these audits be done by nonpartisan professionals, not by partisan officials, and not by sham companies set up to advance the interests of partisan officials, like we saw with the cyber ninjas. Uh, risk limiting audits aren't the most um, enthralling part of voting rights that you know they go through specific um, steps that need to be taken in these audits, but it's important that they happen regularly. It's important that they happen by these nonpartisan officials, states. Every state does election audits. This isn't something new. The fact that they've been made partisan is, relatively speaking, something new. One of the many important provisions in the Freedom to Vote Act is that it sets standards for risk limiting audits, specific ones that every state would have to follow uh, uniformly across the country. And that is something we really need. Great. Question six is what or best practices on early voting, a topic that is up for voter approval in Connecticut by ballot this year? So early voting, um, I think the two most important things are first, that there's a good amount of time for it. The Freedom to Vote Act would require all states to allow at least 15 days of early voting. And around that two week measure, something the Brennan Center often advocates for, it allows people to live their lives. Um, you know, this is obviously a, a group of people who care about voting, and I'm a voting rights lawyer, but not everyone is able to think about voting all the time. And if they have multiple weeks where they're able to find the day that works for them, it's gonna allow turnout to be up, it's gonna allow people to feel safe and confident when they vote. We also wanna see that there are weekend and non-business hour options. Some people work all the time during the day, whether that's nine to five, five days a week, whether that's a more irregular or erratic schedule, and the ability for someone to say, okay, tonight I get off work at 9 p.m. and I'm going to go over and vote is a great option. Um, we saw in Harris County, Texas, the local officials in 2020 had weekend voting. They had a couple nights of 24-hour voting, and tens of thousands of people showed up and used that. So it's important, not necessarily that the polls are open 24 hours every day for weeks on end, but that different opportunities are given um, for people who can't necessarily show up on election day or a couple of days before during business hours. Uh, and finally, I'll just note that it's important that early voting coupled with forms like making election day being a holiday and access to mail ballots, that's just gonna allow the most number of eligible voters to vote and it's gonna eliminate problems like long lines on election day. Great. Okay, question seven um, is asked you to expound a little bit on something that you've already spoken about. The CT referendum this fall will simply ask if early voting should be available to CT voters or not. Since legislators will approve the process, what role does a town play in deciding local implementation? Well, it's the, the local election officials who may be at a, a town or county level who play really the entire role in doing that. So often we think of election officials and poll workers as being people who set up tables and check us in when we show up to vote, but they do so much more. They're the ones in many cases, like I was just mentioning about Harris County and Texas, who decide when the polls are open for early voting. Um, they decide if they're going to do weekend hours, for example. They also are the ones developing best practices for how to deal with things like long lines or when there's confusion over whether or not someone is eligible. They also respond to changing circumstances. So many of the great things we saw in 2020 we're due to local election officials, whether it was deciding we're gonna weekend hours, whether it was deciding we're gonna allow more mail balloting, they did a great job. And it's so important that we allow election officials the confidence and the authority to continue responding to that. Even before 2020, we would see, um, unfortunately, every few years, an election be affected by a natural disaster. You know, a hurricane or a tornado or something hit a couple of days beforehand. Maybe the power just went out coincidentally at a polling place the morning of. Election officials, the local officials are the ones deciding what to do, how to get voters to vote, looking at the laws, what can we do, what can't we do. It's so important that we protect them so they play a huge role. Um, and as a final piece here, I'll mention that a colleague of mine, a colleague of mine and I wrote an article about the importance of election officials talking about some of these things a couple months ago. Hopefully we can put in the chat for those of you that are interested in learning. Excellent. Okay, question eight. What roles do state legislators, le legislatures, Congress, and the executive branch play in changes to voting laws? State legislatures um, generally are the ones with the power to make 
voting laws. That's kind of the default rule we play by in the United States is states set their own voting rules, and that's a power that derives from the Constitution. But the Constitution, Article 1, also says that Congress may at any time by law make or alter regulations relating to voting, and it's a power Congress has used many times throughout its history. So Congress has a significant role to play, in particular when we see states passing repressive laws and restricting the vote. That's the chance for Congress to step in, make things right, or maybe states just have bad audit procedures. Well, that's a chance for Congress to step in and play a role of understanding that in some cases we need national uniform legislation, but at the same time, states always in the first instance getting to make the laws relating to voting. Also, an important point on Congress's power and the responsibility, we often think of the Constitution kind of separately from the amendments, but the amendments are every bit part of the Constitution, and some of them relate directly to voting. The 14th and 15th Amendments are the two big ones I'll flag there. They're definitely not the only ones. The 14th Amendment has provisions like every citizen is entitled to equal protection under the law, every citizen is entitled to due process. The 15th Amendment, as I mentioned, um, bars discrimination in voting based on race. Both of those amendments have provisions that specifically say Congress may make laws to enact the foregoing in these amendments. Those are tremendously important and Congress should be taking advantage of those to pass some of the, the federal laws like the Freedom to Vote Act and John Arlo's Voting Rights Advancement Act. Finally, on the executive branch, they also play a really important role. Sometimes it's just with funding and making sure states have the resources to do the things they need to do relating to elections. Sometimes it might be directing a Department of Justice to be a little more aggressive in pursuing um, the pursuit of voting rights over states who are passing some suppressive measures. Very good, Andrew, thank you. Um, all right, that concludes our league prepared questions and we are going to move to uh, audience questions now. Uh, the first question is, with Shelby V. Holder gutted and the Senate ineffectual, is a new constitutional amendment required? Even that question, it's a really good one. Um, I'm going to uh, assume not everyone knows about Shelby County v. Holder. Um, I'll be really quick in saying what it is. Um, the Civil Rights Act of 19, or excuse me, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was one of the most important pieces of civil rights legislation we've had in our country. It protected the right to vote um, in a lot of ways. And one of the key ones was it created was called preclearance. And there was where states with histories of voting discrimination had to receive approval from either the Federal Department of Justice or a federal court in Washington, D.C. where they could implement voting laws. The system worked beautifully and made a huge difference in minorities' access to voting in those states. In 2013, in the Shelby County case, the Supreme Court struck down the formula for determining which states are covered. To be clear, the Supreme Court has said over and over, preclearance itself is constitutional, but it said the formula to decide which states are covered was out of date and therefore unconstitutional. Justice Ginsburg in dissent said it was like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Immediately, we saw the effects. Texas passed the nation's most suppressive voter ID bill the same day. The federal court later found that voter ID bill was intentionally discriminatory. It is extraordinarily difficult to convince a federal court that a law is intentionally discriminatory. So that was a really, really difficult defeat for voting rights. And, and that's one of the reasons we've seen some steps backwards over the last few years. As to the second part of the question of whether a constitutional amendment is required, I think the answer is no. Um, a constitutional amendment, generally speaking, is going to uh, require 67 votes in the Senate. So if they can't pass legislation on something, it's hard to imagine we'll be able to pass a constitutional amendment on it. Specifically, as to the Freedom to Vote Act and the Voting Rights Advancement Act, I mentioned the Freedom to Vote Act, that congressional authority is in the Constitution already in Article 1, and then amendments like the 14th and 15th. And the Voting Rights Advancement Act similarly would come from those same sources. Um, as I said, the Supreme Court has approved preclearance over and over. Um, so that is there and ready to be restored if we can get a formula to do it. Okay. All right. Our next, um, the audience question is, what is your opinion of a recent op-ed in the Greenwich Time that's su suggesting that we change how we elect members of the U.S. Congress? Fred McKinney wrote, eliminate congressional districts and thereby eliminate gerrymandering. Candidates would need statewide support in order to be elected or re-elected. 
That's a really good question. Um, and I'll, uh, you know, I'll start by noting that ideas like this always have pluses and minuses. So yes, we eliminate gerrymandering, but in so doing, we probably give greater power to political parties. Um, we see systems closer to this in Europe um, in proportional representation where everyone in a country or a region within a country will vote and say uh, a state, say we implement that and a state gets 10 seats, how that'll work is everyone will vote not for candidates, but for a political party. And if a political party gets 60% of the vote, they get six seats. Who gets to fill those seats? Well, the political party puts out a list of 10 people, ranked one through 10. And in this case, the first six get chosen to go to the legislature. Um, you know, so that's a potential drawback on that. There are other ways, I'll also mention, that we can address the gerrymandering problem. We can, some states have done this, and it's something the Supreme Court has endorsed as constitutional, is do, uh, neutral committees that are picked with people from uh, both parties select some of the people that go on there and rather than being the politicians themselves drawing the line it's independent arbiters. Okay. If freedom to vote does not pass what legal and it has not what legal tools are available to fight dirty elections. Sure. Um, there's still a lot of tools available that we at the Brennan Center and, and allies and coalitions are continuing to use. The first is the path to voting rights reform is never completely over. It obviously looks right now like the Freedom to Vote Act isn't gonna pass and, and that may be the case, but that doesn't mean we should consider it dead and never look at it again. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was first the Voting Rights Act of 1957, but they couldn't get it through Congress. So then it was the Voting Rights Act of 1964, still couldn't get it through Congress. And in 1965, finally, the political will was there to get it done. I hope we're not eight years away from the Freedom to Vote Act passing. I hope something changes in the coming weeks or months, but obviously the reality is, is probably not the case. Good news is there are other tools. Uh, we can continue to advocate in state legislatures. Talks about Connecticut as an example of a place that's moving forward and implement really important pro-voter reforms. And we can continue to advocate in states that we see more as backsliding and making sure whether it's making sure the worst things don't pass or it's getting them to do some good things alongside that that's a fight we won't give up on and we're going to continue to partner with people and groups in those states to do that. We also have litigation. Litigation isn't uh, the best tool necessarily because cases take a long time to litigate. They require a lot of resources. During the time the case is ongoing, these repressive rules are in effect. You can't undo elections that are uh, done with people not having correct access to the ballot. I can tell you we we're part of a lawsuit suing Texas over this law. Um, and as long as we see states passing laws like these, we and others in the voting rights community are gonna stand up against them in court or through any avenue we can. Okay. Is the US Postal Service still posing an impediment to mail-in voting nationwide? Does mail-in voting provide a viable alternative to drop boxes? So I'm going to start by noting that it's, I think it's something we just don't have to see as an alternative. We can have mail-in voting and absentee ballots that are returned both through the mail and in drop boxes. As long as something is secure and convenient, it's something that we should advocate for in both um, returning ballots through the Postal Service and through drop boxes are things we've seen have success and we should push for more. The the issues with the Postal Service that we saw um, that, that definitely had a political spin on them in 2020 aren't um, as big a concern now. We've moved out of uh, some of the worst phases of the pandemic, of course, not everywhere, and that's something that's ebbed and flowed, but some of the challenges we saw with the Postal Service in 2020 aren't currently in the same place. We, we wanna see the Postal Service properly funded. Um, you know, it's, it's an independent agency that faces a lot of challenges, others don't. But I, I, right now, and, and if you cast a mail-in ballot, you know, cast it with plenty of time. Um, states generally have resources you can look online to see if it's been uh, received, to see if it's been counted. Use those, call in and ask questions if they have it. Okay. Okay. Um, can you give an elevator pitch for or against ranked choice voting as a general matter? Does evidence suggest that ranked choice voting increases or decreases likelihood that more moderate, we will have more moderate candidates. So I'm not um, 
I haven't seen research suggesting that ranked choice voting uh, has an impact on how moderate um, or I guess how extreme candidates who results from those races are. So I can't answer that directly. As for or against ranked choice voting, I won't necessarily give a pitch um, saying whether I think we should we should or shouldn't have it. But I'll note that there are a lot of benefits. Um, it allows it's a different way to allow people to cast uh, their vote for not one of the major two candidates that we often see in a lot of elections put forward. Right? It prevents us even in a primary. New York City first implemented it last year for the mayoral election and a couple others. And in the primary, it was a way for people to be able to, in the first instance vote their conscious. And then, you know, realistically, if it was only going to come down to a couple people, that second, you can rank that person second or third. It's another way for citizens to be involved. Uh, it also helps with issues like, do we need a majority? In a lot of states, if a majority isn't achieved in a certain race, they do a runoff. Those are expensive. People get tired of having to vote over and over, understandably. Um, ranked choice voting helps alleviate some of those concerns. Six plus states have all mail-in voting. Why would not the, why wouldn't this be considered in Connecticut? It would save money on buying, storing machines, opening schools, getting security, maintenance works, volunteers, etc. Um, so I don't know any reason why it wouldn't be considered in Connecticut. Um, you know, I've, I've encouraged everyone tonight to advocate for the types of reforms you care about through all sorts of different ways. If, if this is a reform you're interested in. Call your state legislator, call your state senator, tell them you want to see this. Advocate for it, speak about it on social media. Um, mail ballots are great for the reasons you said and, and reasons I have said earlier. So yes, there should be more access to mail ballots. And as you've noted, some states well in advance of 2020 did all mail balloting system, no evidence of fraud or other concern in those states. Okay. The last thing Mr. Garber said before questions was that we should rely on facts and the truth. Those enacting all these repressive voting laws do so, as he said, without any actual evidence of voter fraud anywhere. How do we come to consensus or have reasoned debate with those who choose to believe conspiracy theories other than facts? Sure, um, uh, obviously a lot. In that question, and I think the important thing is, um, first of all, to continue relying on facts when you see misinformation, make an effort to correct it, um, you know, do so respectfully. And, and the Brennan Center website um, has so many great resources. You know, the statistic I said, more Americans get struck by lightning and commit voter fraud is the kind of thing you can learn by reading some of our materials on there. Um, so just continue to stay engaged, continue to advocate for the things you care about. Um, you know, and, and I don't want to go too much into all the specific ways to combat inf misinformation and deal with conspiracies because it's um it's a, a dense topic and a difficult one, but I recognize the challenges. Do you see hope that a bipartisan Freedom to Vote Act will pass this year? Yes. Um, now, um, you know, it's it's so difficult to say. Political winds shift and change. Um, I can tell you that we have not given up the fight on that. We think there's a lot of value in continuing to push. And even if it doesn't pass this year, remember that the fight isn't over and a lot of great things have happened. So first of all, these the Freedom to Vote Act and the Voting Rights Advancement Act set the baseline for what we're going to look for in the future. When we talk about federal legislation reforms, we talk about things states are going to be doing, we're going to look at those and say those are the current standards and we need at a minimum the provisions that are in there and the protections that are in there. Uh, you know, we didn't come this close in over half a century to passing comprehensive voting rights reform, two votes in the way uh, in the Senate from being able to overcome filibuster. In the end, it didn't happen, but there's a lot to be proud of that are close. There's a lot of attention on these issues, and the more attention that stays on the issues, and the more times that the media is forced to respond to it, and people are talking about it, the more likely it is it's going to come up again, and the more likely it is it'll be able to pass next time. I don't know if it'll pass this year. Um, you know, use the word hope. So I'm going to say yes, um, but the reality is it will be challenged. General, so it's nine o'clock and we're going to conclude the program. I just want to thank Andrew Garber so much for leading this incredibly valuable and memorable discussion. And thanks to all of you for joining us and asking such great questions. A recording will be on our website to share with others. And I hope that you will join and support the lead.
Finally, you will get an event survey via email tomorrow morning, and we would be very grateful if you could complete it. We are especially interested in knowing if you would like to do more election reform and democracy sustaining programs here in Greenwich. Ranked choice voting is a topic in our February 22nd event that will be live streamed. So please visit our website to sign up for that. Thank you for attending. Participants will now exit Zoom and the session will be closed to the public. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, very, very Thank much. You.